Cars are built differently these days. The time is long gone when the likes of Underseal were an optional extra. These days manufacturers go to great lengths to ensure their vehicles are corrosion resistant. Corrosion is a thinning and weakening of a metal. Its definition is a partial or complete wearing away, dissolving or softening of metal through chemical or electrochemical reaction with the environment around it. Most cars are created from a steel alloy, the main constituent of which is iron. Iron in its natural form is normally found in the ground as either iron oxide iron sulphide or iron carbonate. Um, that means the iron atoms are combined with oxygen, sulphur and carbon atoms. All this is changed in the steelworks. The process of heating the iron up to extremely high temperatures changes the metal into what is called a high energy state. This means that the metal is no longer in the same stable state as it was when it was in the ground. So when it corrodes, it's just returned to its natural state, iron oxide better known as rust. It's a common misconception that water corrodes cars. In fact, pure water alone has no effect on steel. If you place a piece of steel into a container of pure water, nothing will happen. If you then add a mineral like salt, the uh, solution is very corrosive to the steel. The salt turns the water into an electrolyte. This acts as a carrier for the electrons to make up the steel's atoms, which it loses as it begins to return to its natural state thus reversing the process of the steelworks. The more salt in the water, the more corrosive the solution becomes. In Britain, we add salt to our roads uh, for the winter conditions to make sure that they're safe for us. This combined with the minerals that are naturally around in the environment and the rainwater uh, produce a very corrosive environment for our cars. And that's why good paint, good under seal, and washing our cars on a regular basis can protect them. Well, the salt and our damp climate in Britain mean that we need to test for corrosion. But in conjunction with the manual, if testers understand what causes corrosion and how it weakens metal, they'll find that testing for corrosion will not be a problem. The film we're about to do, Robert, is, a, is about corrosion, the test criteria, and how to assess it. And this really shouldn't be a problem to testers. Why is that, Tom? Corrosion is not such a big problem these days because cars are built to resist it, and there's less salt on the roads. And of course, all the information is laid down in the inspection manual. So where do we start? Not far from here. Right, uh, before we start talking about corrosion and structural integrity, Robert, there's a few things the testers need to know. I imagine that a vehicle has to be pretty rotten to fail an MOT test. Well, not always. Uh, I mean, a small amount of corrosion on uh, an important part of the vehicle can make the vehicle unsafe, especially where it destroys the strength and continuity of load-bearing members. On the other hand, um, a heavy amount of corrosion in an, an unimportant part of the vehicle may not affect the safety of the vehicle. And safety critical areas vary depending on the type of vehicle, don't they? Yeah, uh, I mean, a, a seal on one type of vehicle, you know, may have structural integrity and, and not so on another one, not so important. Um, and it depends, say, for example, whether it's um, a chassis vehicle or whether it's monocoque construction. So how does the tester find out which parts of the vehicle are critical? Well, in the inspection manual, in Appendix C, there's the figures A to D, um, and they show the tester this information. The shaded portions deal with the main load-bearing parts of the vehicle. So any corrosion on any of those areas is a failure then? Not necessarily. Just because it's load-bearing doesn't mean to say it's a prescribed area. So the tester needs to understand, as it's explained in Appendix C, that there's prescribed area, there's non-prescribed area, there's highly stressed components, and there's subframes. OK, lead on, Tom. Right. <laughs> so, with a monocoque, the structure bears the load. Now, if you've got a uh, chassis frame, um, with a body bolted to it, then the chassis normally bears the load. And on this uh, specially prepared monocoque, the white paint uh, represents prescribed areas? Yes. So, um, if we imagine that the mounting points for components are the centre of a large ball, 
and the outside of that ball is 30 centimeters from the mountain. So everything within that ball, um, all the support paneling, the load-bearing members, where the components mount and so on, is all the prescribed area. So the tester needs to imagine that, that ball. So, better still, I've got this very large golf ball, <laughs> <laughs> which gives you an idea. So this actually gives us a very good idea of what we're talking about. It's a, a, a sphere about this size, 30 centimetre radius, with the centre at the mounting point. Yeah, exactly right. So, um, you can see that there, yeah? Yeah. Now then, um, you just hang on to that a minute. Well, we've painted in a couple of good examples of prescribed area. But within this part of the vehicle, much more of this is prescribed area. So if we say, like the suspension top mountings here, yeah, so there's mounting there, 30 centimetres. And then from this mounting here, down there, 30 centimetres. Everything within that. Now the tester needs to decide, depending on the vehicle that they're testing, which is support panelling. So for example, we have a mounting bracket here that's within the prescribed area, but it's purely for mounting the engine. So while it supports the engine, it doesn't support the suspension. Yeah, it's not support panelling. If you then say, OK, well, there's a wing fitted here. Now, on this vehicle, it's a bolt-on wing, so it's clearly not support panelling. Um, if the wing were welded on there, the tester would need to consider on that particular vehicle, was that outer wing support panelling? OK, now, with this uh, specially prepared um, monocoque with the white paint stripped down, and when we've got something like this to look at, it's easy to uh, imagine. But that's exactly what... Uh, that's exactly what testers need to do. It's a matter of imagining uh, this area with all of the components and trim within it. Yeah, and that's why it's so important to grasp this concept of this large ball, this 30 centimetre radius ball. And will testers come across prescribed areas as they follow their test routine? Of course they will. Yeah. As they go through the inspection routine, they come to anything, steering and suspension, at section two in the inspection manual, prescribed area. Section three, that's brakes, pres has prescribed areas. Uh, seat belts, section five, has prescribed areas. And to make this clearer, we're going to now have a look at seat belt mountings. OK. So again, Tom, here with everything stripped out, it's very easy to see uh, where the prescribed areas are. Yeah. So we've got mountings here for a seat belt. So when the tester here is testing, they would need to consider the inner sill the outer sill, um, the door pillar. It may be that they'd have to consider uh, wheel arches, and they'd have to consider the floor pan. In fact, any uh, panelling or structure that was supportive to that mounting point. And what about this uh, prescribed area here, Tom, around the handbrake? Because uh, it's much larger than the 30 centimetre radius that we've been talking about. Yeah. Well, well on the seat belt, 30 centimetres. On the park brake, there's a mounting here, there's a mounting right back there. So you take the 30 centimetres out from there. So, hence the bigger prescribed area. So, Tom, if we had uh, some corrosion, uh, a small hole the size of this mark here, uh, what would this vehicle fail on? Because it's within this prescribed area and within this one. We've got a corroded hole, excessive corrosion. It's within 30 centimetres of the seat belt mounting. So it fails on seat belt, the defect is corrosion. But it's also within 30 centimetres of the pipe brake mounting. So it fails on pipe brake, the defect is corrosion. And the tester must record both those failure items on the VT30. Must be dozens of uh, prescribed areas on a vehicle. Well, here, if you, if you look up in this area here, huge prescribed area that, that relates to the braking section, let's say. Um, if you were to imagine that the, that the seat here had the seat belt attached to the frame of the seat, then all of the seat mountings would be prescribed area. It, it, there'd be a yeah, huge prescribed area. We've just painted these in, because if we painted all of them, it'd be very confusing. What about access? Can, can a tester uh, lift up or remove carpet to get a better look? If the carpet was not fastened down, then they could gently you know, you know, lift it and, and uh, check in that way, as long as they don't damage the carpet, as long as they replace it. But if it's fastened down, uh, no, they, they can't remove it at all. Um, so if they can't actually see it, they have to carry out the best possible test that they can. 
And on a similar note, if the boot was full of luggage and the, the tester uh, couldn't do a full inspection? If it prevented them doing a full inspection, then they should refuse to test the vehicle. Now, if they'd carried out their pre-checks, um, then usually that's when they would have discovered that. OK, so that's uh, prescribed areas. Tom, what are highly stressed components? They're the actual components themselves. So from steering suspension, we're talking about arms, rods, levers, those kind of components. What about subframes, Tom? How should a tester deal with them? Th they deal with them the same way they do a chassis. Yeah, so when they assess them, they need to consider deliberate modification that significantly reduces the original strength, excessive corrosion, damage, fractures, uh, inadequate repairs. And we'll be looking at repairs later on. What about corrosion outside of a prescribed area? Right. This is dealt with in Section 6 in the Inspection Manual, and that's body and structure. What do we need to know here? Right. The tester needs to think about excessive corrosion, deliberate modification, damage, fracture, inadequate repairs. But now they're saying to themselves, which would adversely affect the brakes or steering because it's re severely reduced the strength and continuity of main load-bearing structural members. And how should a tester consider a vehicle like this? They say to themselves, how would it respond when driven in all its normal conditions? Anything else? There's, there's bodywork itself. Uh, and now the tester saying to himself, have I got um, jagged edges or projections that are caused by corrosion or damage? And would they result in a danger to other road users? And that includes pedestrians. And the manual tells testers how to assess for corrosion, doesn't it? Yeah, and now we're going to look at a complete car and, and go through how we make those assessments. Right. Right, we've identified the main load-bearing members and prescribed areas, yeah, because we've noted the construction of the vehicle, we've looked at diagrams in the inspection manual. Now what the tester needs to do is they need to assess the extent of any corrosion. Very simple. First thing, visual inspection, they look at it. Yeah. and then finger thumb pressure and they'll s squeeze and check the condition of the metal. If it, if it were to crumble away when they squeezed it, yeah, due to corrosion, that's excessive corrosion. Or maybe it wouldn't feel rigid yeah, due to corrosion, that's excessive corrosion. And what have you got here, Tom? Oh, this? This is a, <laughs> this is a corrosion assessment tool. Uh, very simple little device and, and the uh, tester can use this to assess the extent of the corrosion. A hefty whack with that would do the trick? Absolutely not. <laughs> now, if necessary, uh, the tester can use this and uh, they can just uh, tap it with this plastic end here, just lightly tap it to check um, the, the, the corrosion. Um, what testers don't do is get hold of it like this yeah, and dig into the structure of the vehicle. And when you're tapping, it's the sound that it makes that's important. Yes, it is, yeah. If you've got um, metal that's excessively corroded, or maybe it's been treated with filler, it'll make a duller sound. Good metal has a different sound. And I need to emphasise, it's only light tapping. Yeah. So, just like that. Yeah, good metal, that. And I imagine it's uh, very useful when you're assessing something like a seal. Yeah, it is very good for checking seals, because it's seals are the kind of component that get treated with filler, and then that gets painted over or maybe covered in sealant, so uh, the sound of it's important. And why has it actually got uh, a flat end here and a rounded end there, Tom? Hmm. Well, spotted a bit. This flat end is, uh, is what I was using when I was tapping the good metal just to sound it out. The rounded end is if I've, you know, considering a corroded area, I can check the extent of the corrosion by tapping with a rounded end. And what about this uh, shaped end, Tom? What's that for? Right. Now, this is, this is used for scraping. When, when, I, when I'm using this corrosion assessment tool, I just hold it lightly like that and just do light scraping yeah, just to see the condition of the metal. The tool is for removing loose material and dirt. It mustn't be used to scrape or remove under seal or paint, for example. If you were, say, dealing with highly stressed components, you, you could use this for that. What the tester needs to assess is it seriously reduced in overall thickness, you know, and therefore excessively corroded. But some of, some of the components, because of their design, they've got difficult areas and you can't get in with this. Uh, testers are entitled to use a small screwdriver to, to scrape away and clean in there. So what constitutes a failure in a prescribed area? Well, let's remind ourselves, what we're talking about is any part of a load-bearing member or its supporting structure or supporting panelling within a prescribed area. Yeah. 
when the tester assesses that, visual inspection, then with finger thumb pressure, let's say perhaps it doesn't feel rigid yep, because of corrosion, or it crumbles to leave a hole due to corrosion, either with the finger thumb pressure or you know, penetrated with a corrosion assessment tool. Any of those things I've discussed are a reason for ejection. What if it's just a, a tiny hole, Tom? Right, what you're talking about is, is local, localised corrosion. So localised corrosion in a prescribed area, even if it's a tiny hole or a small split, that's the reason for rejection. And what about where panels overlap? These are referred to as multi-skin panels. When I say that, I'm talking about no air gaps between the panels. The sheets of metal are close together. We, we, we treat that and assess that as if it were a single panel. And what if the uh, corrosion is just on the surface? OK, so we've got uh, corrosion that hasn't weakened the structure, yeah? Um, this would not be a reason for rejection. Um, but the tester should tell the presenter that corrosion has started. Um, on the other hand, maybe we're dealing with excessive corrosion that would fail, and the corrosion is so severe the tester may decide not to carry out certain parts of the test, like a roller brake test, because, you know, they may damage the vehicle. What about vehicles uh, with separate chassis? So let's think about the chassis. And use an example of a suspension mounting. If we had excessive corrosion in a prescribed area around that mounting, it may not extend to the body. If you look at it from another point, if we had, say, excessive corrosion in a prescribed area for a seatbelt mounting in the body, it may not extend to the chassis. So we've looked at uh, corrosion, Tom. Uh, what about repairs, particularly where a repair has been carried out uh, within a prescribed area? It is a very important part of the assessment. You know, the tester needs to be able to assess that these are acceptable repairs. And we've got some examples over here that we can look at. Correct. It's essential that repairs are properly carried out. It's only welding is acceptable for repairs to prescribed areas. Um, Brazen, etc., is only acceptable where the manufacturer originally used it. And what about the materials used? Materials must be of a appropriate gauge or thickness, uh, uh, any plating or welding, um, and that must extend to a sound part of the load bearing member or structure. Uh, the most important thing to consider is that it is virtually as strong as the original. So, is it okay to patch repair? It is okay to patch repair, but these patch repairs must be a continuous seam weld, even when they extend beyond the prescribed area. So no spot welds then? Well, spot welds are acceptable where they originally existed, yeah? but all of the defective panel, including its flanges, must have been removed. Now, I've got a couple of examples here. This is a, a, what's referred to as a full cell. Um, now, this would... This could be spot welded where the manufacturer originally spot welded it. But what we're saying here, Robert, is that all of the old panel will have been removed. This replaces it. What about um, plug or stitch welding? Well, plug or stitch welding is a suitable replacement for a spot weld. And what about this other one? Right, now this other one, now this is um, a cover sill. And if I just do this, you can just see it fits exactly onto there. If this is fitted on, this is just a large patch. It must be continuously seam welded all the way around. And Tom, what if a patch repair extends beyond the prescribed area? So we're talking about a great big patch now, yeah. That must be a continuous seam weld. And there are several other repair methods, aren't there? Yes, there's uh, brazing, soldering, uh, glass fibre repairs. Now these are bonding processes and they aren't normally suitable for repairs to prescribed areas, say, but th th they are normally acceptable for other repairs. Under what circumstances are they acceptable for repairs to the prescribed yeah. area? Uh, they're suitable in, the, uh, in circumstances where the manufacturer originally constructed the vehicle that way, but once again the tester has to consider that they are comparable to the original in strength. And it's not actually easy to spot some of these, uh, particularly if the repair's been painted over or covered in underseal. No, it isn't always easy. I've, I've got a little bit mocked up here. Take, for example, with brazing. Um, maybe the tester could be looking for the smooth fillet of filler that's in here, or they might have the opportunity to see it's, it would have a gold coloration that, uh, uh, if it were brazed, yeah? Um, and then, of course, there's, uh, there's glass fibre, there's fillers, there's aluminium. Um, they sometimes have a different appearance. The test could be looking for that. Or uh, if they tap them, they have a different sound uh, using a magnet. 
Though a magnet's not going to be any use for non-metallic structures. No, it isn't, no. And these um, GRPs, glass-reinforced plastic vehicles, are becoming more common these days. And now we've got combinations of vehicles where they, they can have, um, you know, steel chassis, and then you have, like, a monocoque plastic construction. So if items like uh, steering racks, subframes and seat belts can be mounted directly onto plastic structures which don't have metal reinforcement, what would testers be looking for? They'd be looking for weakness in the prescribed areas. Yeah. Um, they'd be looking for cracks such as this one here, uh, separation or delamination like we have down here, which is the parting of the layers. Um, they'd be looking at where components are mounted, you know, flexing of these components, um, so that it's clear that, it, that they're likely to work loose or to break away. Now, all those things I've just mentioned are reasons for rejection. And what about repairs to plastic? Right, repairs to plastic that form part of the prescribed area or load-bearing member, um, they need to ask themselves, is this repair as strong as the original? What if a panel has been removed and replaced with a different material from the original? Right, that's a good point. Any vehicle of integral structure, like a monocoque, yeah, the removal of a panel or the replacement of a panel of a different material, that can affect the strength and the stiffness of the whole structure. So you can't replace a steel panel with a plastic panel in a prescribed area? It's unacceptable to, to replace with plastic or to repair corroded or, or weak metal sections with a plastic, you know, to a prescribed area or to load-bearing members. And if a tester is dealing with such a vehicle, then that vehicle would be failed. What about those vehicles with a separate chassis? All the things we've talked about will apply. Now, in Appendix C, we talked about the figures, A to D, you know. So, figure B deals with uh, subframe type of construction. Um, C and D deal with monocoque construction. Um, and Figure A deals with the chassis type of construction and it shows in that diagram where the steering box mounts, where the suspension components mount. Does this apply to the body attachments to a chassis? Yes, and this will be found in inspection manual in section 6, which deals with body security. And what's the tester looking for here? There's a whole list of them, um, but for instance, they're looking for presence, they're looking for security, they're looking for um, excessive wear, damage, fractures, they're looking at the brackets, so they're, they're looking for all these defects on the body and they're looking for the defects on the chassis. Does that include shock absorber mounting? There used to be a note in section 2.4 on page 11 that said shock absorber mountings were not prescribed area. That note's been removed now. So shock absorber mountings are prescribed area. And is there anything else we need to know, Tom? But one final point. Testers need to remember that they're assessing all the repairs, even those that have been passed in previous years. Now, I've got one final thing that we need to look at. Okay. <laughs> Tom, look at this. That's great. An E-type. Yeah. It looks in perfect <laughs> nick, too. Well, most cars of this age would have rotted away a long time ago, you know, but this one's been carefully restored. Any corrosion in it's been cut out and been replaced. So, yeah, it's in gorgeous nick. Uh, fancy a spin? Be rude not to. <laughs> of course, this was recently voted uh, the most beautiful car. Yeah, let's not have a row about it, Tom. <laughs> well, it is to me. <laughs>